So, thanks very much indeed, Ferdia, uh, for that perfect segue out into the marine environment. Um, so, this may be as much of the marine environment as a lot of us ever see, a view out over the surface of the sea, and perhaps some fossicking around in the rocks and the, and the rock pools, finding a few uh, seaweeds, slippery seaweeds and, and scratchy barnacles. But though most of us rarely think about it in these terms, Ireland is, of course, an, an island nation. Um, and that with 90% of its territory underwater, deep underwater a lot of it, and so kind of out of sight, out of mind. But people who work at sea will tell you, will remind you that, it, that it's an island nation and that it looks very, very different when you start seeing it from looking from the sea to the land rather than from the land out to sea. People who live in island communities also take a much more maritime perspective uh, as well, and we also have some wonderful reminders of how important uh, Ireland's marine biodiversity has been to our, to our forebears. Almost all of the sea creatures that live in this kind of coastal zone have names in Irish as well as in English and, and Latin. And there are some wonderful kind of poems and stories capturing uh, people's connection with the sea uh, and, and, the, and the value that they've taken from, from, from marine creatures over the years. So even if you do confine yourself to the coast uh, and the parts that you or I could easily get access to and wander around in uh, and, and could easily kind of uh, see what we can find when the tide is out, you'd already find quite a lot of remarkable creatures just in these kinds of areas. And the first thing you probably would see would indeed be the seaweeds. And perhaps for a lot of us, that's a bit of an off-putting thing. We're worried we might slip over on them. We're worried about them tangling around our ankles and concealing uh, strange lurking dangers. But actually, they are a very uh, important part of the coastal ecosystem. They're really the foundation for our coastal ecosystems. Um, they are among the most productive habitats on Earth. Uh, they produce thousands of tons of new seaweed every year, um, which are food for a lot of creatures living right then and there. But also then many of those, those uh, seaweeds get knocked off the rocks, ripped off the rocks by the winter storms, and they get carried as detritus down into the, onto the seabed, and they, they form the basis for, for uh, coastal sort of marine food webs uh, that start down, down there on the seabed. And there is beauty as well, if you, if you look for it. All right? If you take some time and, and start to look into the pools and see beauty of the delicate algae, you'll also start to see uh, animals, which will keep Ferdia happy. So we start to see some, some gorgeous and, and remarkable creatures, like this sea anemone, that kind of, with a wealth of colorful uh, snails of different kinds. And things that you might not even really realize uh, are living creatures. So these, among the more innocuous, but actually the more numerous and influential creatures that we find on our, our rocky shores, are these limpets. So, so they, you can see the ones at the bottom of the picture are in their natural habit. They haven't been pulled off the rock to take a photograph. Um, and they look like a little Chinese hat. And when I bring people to the shore, sometimes people are really surprised to find that there's actually a living creature in there at all. They think it's part of the geology or it's something that's kind of fossilized. But there is a snail inside there with, with no more than about four or five brain cells. But nevertheless, it can actually set out and forage searching for its food out to around seven meters during low tide, and then finds its way back. They're able to navigate their way back to a permanent home scar that they carve out on the rock. They are the, the grazers of the shore. They're feeding on the, on the slimy green seaweeds and the little baby seaweeds uh, on the shore. So they're essentially the cows or the bison or the zebras or the wildebeests of the rocky shore. Uh, and they also have to contend with predators. So, but the predators are not lions. Instead, they have to be concerned with seabirds and with crabs and with starfish that are trying to uh, get the, uh, the tasty morsel inside. But they're actually surprisingly able to defend themselves. So they, they're very, very sensitive. If there's a slightest vibration on the rock of an approaching bird or a bird that's pecking another shell nearby, they clamp themselves right down and make themselves more, more invincible. They're also able uh, to mushroom up. They kind of stand up on their, on their shell and then clamp back down hard on the claws of the crabs 
or the tentacles of the starfish to protect themselves. So they have remarkable ways uh, to defend themselves. And strangely, they, they all start out life uh, as males, and they transition to females when they become large enough to produce large numbers of eggs. So there's a whole and a wealth of enthusiastic people learning about limpets and, and studying their extraordinary biology as well, strange, strange as it may seem. Um, but I always think that these, kind of, these life and death dramas are going on all the time, all around us. So nature is always doing these things, these life and death struggles. Um, so, and while we're carrying on with our own uh, dramas in our own lives, but we can always take time out to take a look at, at what's going on in nature, um, take some inspiration from that, and it's all part of our life support system, seething away in the background. Similarly, if we go out onto a fairly unappealing looking mudflat, like ones around Dublin Bay or in Dundalk Bay, uh, they, they, there doesn't look to be much life there, but if you go a little closer and start fossicking around, dig a little, you'll find evidence of a whole multitude of worms, small kind of uh, crabs and shrimp-like organisms, different kinds of mollusks and so on. And again, this is a very productive habitat, and it provides a larder for a whole range of wading bird species that people are much more concerned uh, with, with looking after. And of course, all of these uh, organisms have uh, stories and strategies around the way that they live, the way that they find food, they avoid being eaten, they build homes for themselves, they produce uh, offspring. But if we really want to um, get to grips with islands marine biodiversity, we need to really take stock of how much of it we're blessed with and, of course, are responsible for at the same time. So maps, maps like this have been dubbed the real map of Ireland, especially by the Marine Institute, uh, because it shows that the sea area of Ireland is seven to ten times as extensive as the, as the, as the, the, the land area. And, and within that area, which, of course, you know, we've drawn lines around it here on the map. None of the species that live there care about those lines, so it's fully interconnected with all of the other oceans and seas uh, around us. But we have this uh, huge range of different kinds of habitats, from the ones that are very close to the shore, stretching all the way out to the abyssal plain there, the deep sea, where if you are standing on the bottom there in the abyssal plain, you've got four and a half kilometer column of water sitting on your head. All right, so they're, they're, and, and there, are, there are different species uh, in all of those different kinds of habitats. So this is what Ireland really looks like when the weather is good. But if we want to um, are prepared to get a little bit wetter um, and maybe put on a mask and snorkel or perhaps have our first scuba diving trip and we go under the waves, we start to discover a completely different world. Um, and it's also an extremely diverse world, all right? So life began in the seas. So there are still fundament more different, fundamentally different kinds of organisms uh, in the sea th than there are in the land, all right? So at a fundamental level, the, the diversity is greater, although in terms of species, there are far more different kinds of insect species than almost everything else put together. But even close to the coast, you'll find lots of different kinds of invertebrates, that's animals without backbones, like these sea urchins and sponges uh, and corals, um, and also anemones and all sorts of other, other species. And if you look at the sea, these are rocky habitats, but if you go to a muddy seabed again, there's a whole new diversity of life, different from the, the kind that live uh, in the intertidal, uh, up on the shore that we can get easy access to. So including things like this nephrops, which is also known as scampi, or Dublin Bay prawn, so this is something that we like to eat and which is fished uh, just not very far from here out in, the, out in the Irish Sea, very close to Dublin Bay. But of course, once you go underwater, you're much more likely to start bumping into the kinds of things that we particularly associate with the sea, for example, the, the, the fish species. Uh, and fish are the most diverse and abundant kind of vertebrates on the planet. All right, so vertebrates, animals with backbones. And Ireland is, Irish waters host 400 different species of fish, many of which form the basis for the productive fisheries that are the mainstay of many coastal communities. But we also have 
some remarkable and curious species, lots of remarkable and curious species. This is just one example. This is a sunfish, which is the largest bony fish on the planet. And if you go down to Mizzen Head and look out over the sea, you can sometimes see them there lolling around in the shallows eating jellyfish, which is their staple diet. We also have some really awesome uh, creatures like this basking shark. This is, so this is the second largest of any kind of fish in the sea, uh, second only to the whale shark. And like many of the big things in the sea, it actually feeds on very tiny things. So these guys, are, th that mouth is not about to swallow up a diver. It's, it's engulfing loads and loads of, of microscopic organisms in the water column, small organisms. But these have a long association with Ireland and in folklore and so on as well. And in fact, we have some unique habitats for them. So early, even last year, for the first time, uh, there was a great aggregation of, of basking sharks off the Kerry coast that was filmed for the first time and reported uh, on the news. It may surprise you to know that we have 25 different species of whales of, and dolphins in, in Irish waters. So some of them are kind of great whales like this, many of which are kind of passing through our waters. But we also have uh, smaller species like dolphins and porpoises. These are bottlenose dolphins that are resident uh, in the Shannon estuary. And it's a very well-studied population of, of resident um, bottlenose dolphins. We also have five different species of turtle that you can see in Irish waters, including this, this leatherback, um, which also feed on jellyfish, just like those sunfish. So jellyfish are useful for something. They're not just there to sting you and spoil your day at the beach. <laughs> oh, sorry. We, we also have a wonderful diversity of seabirds. And uh, Ferdia and I kind of discussed who should talk about seabirds because they um, need a bit of land to, to nest on. And indeed, if you go down to the Salty Islands via a boat trip from Kilmore Quay, you can see puffins nesting at this time of year over the next few weeks. Um, but a lot of these kinds of species just come, come ashore for that brief period each year to nest. They spend the rest of their time out in the open sea. And so you need to be able to, if you want to protect any of these species, you need to be able to protect their feeding habitat as well as their breeding habitat. So you need both, both elements for their life cycle. And some of these species travel huge distances. And so they, this has to be an international perspective, all right? So nations working together to conserve the different habitats that they pass through. If one nation fails to protect a species that travels, then the work of the other nations is in vain. And a good example of this is the roseate tern, uh, for which Ireland hosts 50% of the European breeding population. So we have a particular duty of care for these, for example. And all of this life that lives out in the deep open sea is contingent on these tiny plant-like organisms uh, called phytoplankton, which harness the sun's energy to produce the sugars that all life depends on. And incidentally, while they're doing that, they're, they're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere uh, and they're producing oxygen, as much oxygen. It, pretty much every second breath you take uh, is oxygen that's been produced in the sea by these kind of phytoplankton. So they're a pretty significant player uh, in that game. Each of these, of course, also has its own intricate story, its own kind of biology, lots of different species of phytoplankton. And while some of them are toxic to us, and we have to take care about blooms of these harmful algae, we also see wonderful things that they do. Some of them glow in the dark when they're disturbed. Uh, and so this is a site that you can sometimes see on some of Ireland's beaches. And I've seen sites like this. In, the best place was Loch Ine, actually, in West Cork, in one of my first visits to Ireland many, many years ago. Uh, and the phosphorescence would just kind of tri trickle off your fingertips like, like magic as you drag them through the water. Those phytoplankton are fed upon by multitudes of tiny animal uh, species, so the zooplankton, um, which are in turn then the link to the rest of the food chain. So fish and other large animals feed on these zooplankton. When, en when any of these things don't get eaten and die, they sink gently down into the deep sea. So the deep sea, as I say, in Ireland's deepest point is four and a half kilometers deep. There's absolutely no light down there at all. It's pitch dark. Um, it's freezing cold, and there's an immense pressure of water. Um, and this is a vast environment, OK? It's the most extensive environment on Earth. And in terms of volume, it's, it's huge as well. So there's, uh, there's, a, there's a different kinds of living things at different depths in the water and at different depths on the seabed all the way throughout there. 
It's pretty sparse when you get down deep, but if you go down with a modern submersible that actually has some lights, you can start to see remarkable creatures, many of which are, are yet to be discovered. These are cold water corals that were only discovered a few decades ago. And it turns out that island, in, in Irish waters, there are extensive uh, beds of these cold water corals that, like their tropical counterparts, provide a home for lots and lots of different associated species. Um, and in fact, we're gradually discovering that there's far, far more extensive reefs of these deep sea cold water corals than there are of, of the tropical ones, the, Bar the Great Barrier Reef. But they're very, very slow growing, uh, and they're very fragile. So they, they are very prone to physical disturbance, so if, like trawling. So if they've been trawled a few times, this is what it looks like. So they really do need some special protection in the areas where they grow if you want to conserve this, this source of diversity. So that's all I really ha have time to say as well. And there's so much more to be said, not just about the diversity, uh, the extraordinary range of, of ways of approaching life that these organisms have, but also the ways that they interact with each other and with their environment, the ways in which we benefit from them, and the ways in which we threaten them. Uh, but those are really tales that have been told in, in, in other talks, including the one that's coming straight after this one. So I, I hope you will enjoy your journey through our extraordinary biodiversity, and I, and I really do wish you well in your deliberations around um, how we interact with it now, how we might interact with it in the future, and the things we might need to do to change our relationship with it. So thanks very much, and I really look forward to working with you.